A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. Yoruba Land in the 19th century, other agencies of change. While Yoruba Land was being shaken and transformed by the wars of the 19th century, other powerful forces of change were also at work in the country. Of these, the most important were a great surge in the spread of Islam, a major change in the pattern of relationship with the outside world, and the coming of Christianity and Western education. The spread of Islam. Some account, as would be remembered, was earlier given of the intersection of Islam and the political developments in the Oyo country in the early 19th century. Here, we will give an account of the massive progress of Islam itself, resulting in the fact that by the end of the century, a very substantial part of the population of Yoruba land had become Muslim. It is not known when Islam first made contact with Yoruba land. According to an Aloran tradition, the word Imale, the Yoruba name for Muslims, originally meant a person or people from Mali, the great, strongly Islamic, empire which ruled much of the western Sudan in the 14th century. This would seem to suggest that some Muslims, traders or preachers, from Mali first brought Islam to Yoruba land in about the 14th century. In the course of the centuries up to the 18th, Islam became well established in the Hausa kingdoms, the trans-Niger neighbors of the Yoruba people. Throughout those centuries, commercial and social contacts between Yoruba land and Hausa land were very strong. Hausa traders, more and more of whom were Muslims as time passed, traded and lived in probably all parts of Yoruba land while Yoruba traders traded and lived even in the farthest Hausa kingdoms as well as in Bornu on the Lake Chad, another Islamic country. By the 18th century, they were Hausa resident communities in many Yoruba towns, especially in the more important trading towns, and Islam was the predominant religion in those communities. The tradition that made every Yoruba king the patron of aliens in his kingdom resulted in the circumstance that Hausa traders lived as guests in many Yoruba palaces, and built the earliest rudiments of their prayer houses at the edge of marketplaces on palace foregrounds. During Clapperton's travel through Yoruba land from Badagri to Oyoila in 18,256, there were small Hausa communities in a few large towns along his route. In spite of all these contacts with Islam, however, Yoruba land did not experience the kind of widespread and deep Islamization that Hausa land did. The indigenous religion of the Yoruba people held its ground against the incoming faith. That does not mean that there was any intolerance of Islam. There was, by and large, none. Yoruba cultural perception of religious faith made it easy for members of the same lineage, in the same Agbo Ila, to belong to different religious cults and worship different gods. When Islam came, it found its place in this cultural setting so that the Yoruba convert to Islam practiced his Islamic worship in complete social harmony with the people of his lineage in the same compound. The Yoruba king who housed and fed alien Muslim traders and priests did so as father of all people in his kingdom and patron of aliens, and, for him, there existed no conflict whatsoever between his doing that and his worshipping the gods of his ancestors. Though, therefore, Yoruba converts to Islam were many as the 19th century opened, they amounted to no more than a very small minority of all Yoruba people. Most of such converts would seem to have lived in the cities and towns in the Oyo country Oyoila itself, Igboho, Isayin, Ikoi, Kuo, and Ogbomoso, as well as the northern Igesa town of Osogbo. In almost every one of these towns, the king's palace housed some foreign Muslims, and there were some native converts. In Igboho, the roots of Islam seem to have gone all the way back to at least the 16th century, Igboho traditions tell of Muslim preachers in the times when the Alafans lived in Igboho. In the southern provinces of the Oyo Empire, some native Muslims also lived in the port towns of Badagri and Ajis, in both of which places there were some Oyo and foreign, mostly Hausa, Muslims. Further eastwards in Yoruba land, that is in Ekiti, Igbamana and Akoko, evidence of Islamic presence by the opening of the 19th century is difficult to find. In such places, through the influence of Nup Muslim traders, there were probably scattered Muslim converts. Adu Palace traditions trace the origins of the Muslim Hausa and Nuuk trading community resident in a wing of the U.S. Palace to the reign of the Uyamano Ola in the 18th century. The important point here, however, is that by the beginning of the 19th century, all these added up to no more than a thin trace of Islamic influence in Yoruba society. The 19th century changed that and changed it quite dramatically. Two separate, different, factors made for such a big change, first, a sharp increase in Islamic evangelism, and second, developments in the political life of Yoruba land. In the first decade of the 19th century a radical Islamic movement led by a Fulani cleric, Usman Dan Fodio, launched a jihad against the Hausa kingdoms from Sokoto. The jihad eliminated the old Hausa dynasties, which had also been Muslim, and replaced them with new rulers, emirs, espousing Dan Fodio's radical, 
puritanical, brand of Islam. The movement also generated a huge wave of evangelism in preaching, teaching and writing. This wave spilled over into Yoruba land immediately, bringing many preachers of the new radical doctrines, some of them Fulani, some Hausa and some Arabs, who spread out into various parts of Yoruba land. The city of Oyoile alone had as many as five of them early in Alaf and Majota's reign, in the first decade of the 19th century. Available evidence indicates that most of the new preaching and most of its preachers in Yoruba land were concentrated in the Oyo country. Of these preachers in the Oyo cities and towns, two became particularly notable an Arab named Muhammad Dan Aja Gumso, and Alimi, about whom much was said in the previous chapter. Some preachers also went far southwest into Igbado as well as coastal towns like Badagri, Lagos and Ijas and, presumably, into Ijebu and eastwards into Igbamana, Ekiti, Ijesa, and Akoko. Most of the clearest information about their activities, however, is from the Oyo country. The new evangelism featured preaching to street-side audiences, fervent criticisms of traditional Yoruba religious and social practices that did not meet the truest standards of Islam, and the teaching of Arabic, the language of the Quran. Considerable emphasis was given to children, and classes were formed for the teaching of the Arabic alphabet to them. Wherever these activities reached, their immediate effect was to infuse new energy and new fervor into existing Muslim converts and Muslim communities, resulting in bold communication of the faith by believers, and the gathering in of converts. In some cities in the Oyo country, it looked as if an all-sweeping Islamic era was about to dawn in the first two decades of the 19th century. Then the reaction started. Though religious tolerance was a strong character of Yoruba culture, the new wave of Islamic activities was seen by many as disruptive in their communities. Yoruba people had very deep respect for individual religious preferences and, therefore, had no objection to Islam, but the wholesale and disrespectful denunciations of all traditional religious and social ways jolted and shocked most hearers. In Oyoila, the leading priests of the different traditional cults went into action. Insisting that the new wave of Islamic evangelism and activities were inimical to the welfare of the kingdom, they wanted the Alaf and Majaja to do something to put an end to the growing danger. Lander who collected most of his information about this Oyoila situation from leading Muslims like Gumso, presents the Oyo high priests as acting merely in defense of their own positions, power and influence. He wrote, The priests became sensibly alarmed at the rapid progress of another and strange belief, so inimical to their best interests, and tending to the injury, if not the complete overthrow, of the power and influence which they themselves and their ancestors had exercised for a series of ages over the minds and actions of the votaries of paganism. But in fact, the priests were not alone in their reaction. The Alafan himself did not have much difficulty in agreeing with them, nor did other functionaries of the Oyoila government. The kingdom and empire were going through difficult times in Majotis' reign, and significant leaders of society seemed to have been nervous about the growing Islamic fervor and noise as yet another source of trouble. Moreover, the available evidence is even more unambiguous that the fervent aggressiveness of the preachers and Muslim converts simply offended the cultural sensitivities of most people, accustomed as they were to a calm acceptance of, and respect for, individuals' religious choices. Lander wrote that the preachers were fond of disseminating, with too great eagerness, their opinions amongst the worshippers of idols. The high priests at last went in a body to the palace and demanded that the Alafan Majata should act without delay, warning gravely that if he failed to do so, he might lose his empire. In response, Majada convened a secret meeting with the priests, and presumably also his chiefs, in the palace, and the meeting decided that the solution was to eliminate the Muslim preachers physically. Some days later, public officials carried out the decision. Gumso was lucky. One of the Alafan's wives came to alert him only seconds before his appointed executioners came to his residence in the palace, and he fled with no clothes on his back, and escaped. Alimi was also probably in Oyoila that day which would account for the popular tradition that he was once driven out of Oyoila by the Alafan. Some preachers were killed at their residences, some others were gathered to the palace and executed. Undoubtedly, the victims included some prominent Oyoila converts who had been active in the Muslim community. From Oyoila, the reaction spread to other Oyo cities and towns, with more or less the same consequences. For the first time in the history of Yoruba land, public policy in a kingdom declared a religious group as enemies of the state. In many cities, even in cities where the Alafan's influence had become very small or non-existent, members of the public, with the connivance or even assistance of important chiefs, insulted, abused and physically molested or killed Muslim converts. The basic details of events at this point are well known the flight of a few Muslims to Salik Baru and Alimi in Aloran, Afanja's offer of refuge to all Muslims, 
the rise of the Jama'a as a force, its devastations in the country and its ultimate revolt against Afonja, ending in Afonja's death. In terms of the progress of Islam in the Oyo country, the period covered by these events and subsequent developments up to the end of the century divides into two the period from 1817 to 1840, and the period from 1840 to the end of the century. The unruly behavior of the Jama'a while fighting under Afonja, 181,724, and their penchant for destruction and rampage in Oyo towns and villages, produced a terrible effect on the spread of Islam. It provoked a heightening of reaction against Islam, resulting in intensified molestations of Muslim converts almost everywhere in the Oyo country. Consequently, more and more Muslim converts fled to Aloran. While increasing the concentration of Muslims in Aloran, this development depleted the ranks of Muslim activists, preachers and teachers in most Oyo cities. In many cities, many Muslims who chose to stay among their relations rather than flee to Aloran lost the will to hold on to their Islamic faith. In terms of the growth of Islam, the revolt of the Jama'a against Afonja and his death in the fighting that resulted, around 1824, led to one set of consequences in Aloran and a totally different set in the rest of the Oyo country. Aloran became decisively an Islamic fortress as more and more Muslim converts fled there from the rest of the country. Inside this Islamic fortress, a fight for dominance quickly developed between the group around Salib Baru and the group, mostly the more radical, more puritanical, Oyo Muslims and the equally radical foreign-born Jama'a, around Alimi. Islamic purists around Alimi increasingly accused Salib Baru and the people around him of allowing too much of traditional Yoruba practices, called Badai in Arabic, in their lives, and therefore of not practicing a sufficiently true Islam. On the other hand, some of the most influential Oyo citizens in Salib Baru's group increasingly resented the growing influence of the foreigners in Alor and in their rampages and destruction in Oyo towns and villages. In the fight that ultimately ensued, Salib Baru's Oksuna was vanquished and he himself was killed. Alimi and his sons thus became the undisputed leaders of the Islamic community in Aloran and the commanders of an Aloran Jihad to conquer Yoruba land for Islam. An Islamic emirate was born in Aloran. In the rest of the Oyo country, the news of Afanja's death at the hands of the Jama and the establishment of foreign rule over Aloran, only greatly intensified popular hostility to Islam. The victories of the Aloran Jama forces over Oyo armies sent to avenge Afanja's death and free Aloran, and the terrible devastations caused by the Aloran cavalry among civilian populations, pushed the hostility to Islam to great heights. In many Oyo towns, only the Hausa trading communities remained as Islamic outposts in a land seared by anti-Islamic anger, and the authorities of many towns prohibited even them from openly professing their faith or teaching the reading of the Quran to the children, on pain of death. As for Oyo Ila, from the time of the killing of the preachers, no Islamic preacher dared to enter the city. By the time of Clapperton's visit to that city in 1826, Islam had long been virtually forgotten there although the Lander brothers were later to see some Hausa Muslims there in 1830. Some preachers moved south into Igbado, hoping for more freedom there, but with mixed results. In Ilaro they apparently did not encounter much hostility, but in Iana they lived under intense official suspicion and restrictions. Faced with this dismal picture with regard to the spread of Islam, the Emir of Aloran at the beginning of the 1830s, by then Shitta, Alamis second son, attempted to convert the Alafan Aliwiwu to Islam, hoping, no doubt, that a Muslim Alafan would open up opportunities for Islam in the Oyo country. After first inviting Aliwiwu to Aloran for a friendly visit, the Emir then invited him a second time for the express purpose of asking him to undergo the Islamic conversion ceremony known in Aloran as tapping the Quran. Aliwiwu, as would be remembered, refused to go because the Emir had been posturing as politically superior to the Alafan. Instead of accepting the invitation, the Alafan embarked on military preparations aimed at wiping out Fulani rule in Aloran. The outcome was a major invasion of Aloran led by Aliwiwu himself, assisted by some Bariba allies. Aliwiwu lost the war and perished in it, and the news of that led to the abandonment of Oyoila by all its people. The desertion of Oyoila, and continued Aloran military pressure southwards, resulted in the desertion of many cities, towns and villages. In their outcome then, Neither the military successes of the Aloran Emirate nor the attempt to convert the Alafan did any good for the spread of Islam. The root of this failure was the mixing of political and religious ambitions by the Muslim leaders of Aloran. It was not necessarily impossible for the emirs and chiefs of Aloran to convert the Alafan to their faith, but as long as the emirs claimed primacy over the Alafan, no Alafan was likely to accept anything from them. As long as they were perceived as foreign conquerors and rebels by most Yoruba people, Aloran people stood little chance of converting many outside the Loran to their faith. Moreover, because of the well-known tendency of the non-Yoruba Jama'a to destroy, 
vandalize and loot, the reputation of vandals and destroyers preceded Aloran armies everywhere. Consequently, inhabitants of towns or villages assailed by Aloran armies, rather than surrender, and thus accept the religion of Aloran, fled and deserted their homes. Almost everywhere in the Oyo country, being a Muslim became synonymous with being an agent of the Aloran invaders and destroyers, and therefore a traitor and subversive. In their attempts to spread their faith, the Islamic rulers of Aloran made no careful attempt to understand Yoruba society and its sensitivities. They purposed to conquer a Yoruba empire for themselves and then give it their religion, but, by and large, such an approach proved counterproductive in Yoruba land. By 1840 then, writes Gabata Mosi in his study of Islam in Yoruba land, the picture of Islam among the Yoruba was largely a dismal one, depicting considerable depletion and disarray. From the first years of the 1840s, however, very significant changes began to appear in this picture, and Yoruba land rapidly evolved into a very different field for the propagation of Islam. The crucial factor was the defeat of Aloran by Ibadan at Osogbo in 1840, the speedy rollback of Iloran's forces to the gate of their own city, and their permanent containment at more or less that boundary. As it became obvious to all that Ibadan's power was a dependable guarantee against Iloran's campaigns of conquest and destruction. Towns and villages largely settled down towns and villages that had survived in the Oyo country, and towns and villages in the fringe areas like northern Ife, Igesa, and Ekiti. Another important factor was the lesson which Islamic preachers and activists had learned. First, Aloran was not going to be able to come to the aid of any Muslim who, by any insensitive Islamic activities, got himself into trouble where he lived. Secondly, the type of frenetic, Aggressive explosions of Islamic fervor common in the first two decades of the century did not work with Yoruba people, it only provoked resistance and hostility. Yoruba people, that is, were not opposed to Islam as such, they were only strongly opposed to the insensitive trampling down of their religion and traditions, and the norms of their interpersonal culture. Even in the worst of times in the 1830s Muslims, foreigners and indigenes alike, who had gone their ways in a calm and civil manner had converted friends and relatives to Islam. Finally. By 1840, there existed for the first time on Yoruba soil an Islamic city. With most of the frontline activists for Islam in Oyo towns pushed into Aloran by persecution, Aloran had become a very strongly Islamic center of worship, preaching and learning a budding Mecca for Yoruba Muslims, an Islamic resource center of growing importance and influence in Yoruba land. As fears of military pressure from Aloran receded, contacts between inhabitants of Aloran and the rest of Yoruba land slowly expanded. Traders from Aloran slowly established confidence to ply the trade routes all over Yoruba land, even to the coast through Ijebu, Igba, and Ondo. People from all over the country went to Aloran to see their relatives who had fled to Aloran and had become citizens there, and people from Aloran went to search for relatives who had been dispersed to various towns. Slowly but surely, Aloran was reintegrated into the family of Yoruba cities and towns, in spite of its non-Yoruba emir, and, as that happened, its religious influence in Yoruba land grew. The concatenation of these three factors Ibadan's containment of Iloran's military aggression, the growth of a more carefully considered and more culturally appropriate approach by Islamic preachers and activists to Islamic evangelism, and the emergence of Aloran as a Yoruba Islamic resource center improved the prospects for Islam in Yoruba land continually for the rest of the century. One common consequence was that Muslims among Oyo people who had migrated to the Middle Belt and southern parts of Yoruba land were able at last to start openly practicing their faith and quietly propagating it. For instance, in Iloro, an Oyoila prince named Aduyemi and his Muslim family became the nucleus of an Islamic community. They had started cautiously before 1840 to gather the few Muslims in the town. In the years after 1840, the new community grew considerably, with Aduyemi, who had a fair knowledge of the Quran, as its leader. Thereafter, generations of the Aduyemi family provided the leadership of the Islamic community in Iloro. This story of quiet and successful revival of Islam in Iloro by refugees from places in the northern Oyo country was replicated in many towns Saki, Osogbo, Iwo, Ogbomoso, Eid, as well as towns in Ife, Ijesa, Igba, Igbado, and Ijebu. In general, the Muslims among the northern Oyo refugees were more knowledgeable than the Muslim natives of the towns further to the south, and they therefore usually supplied the drive and the leadership for the revival of Islam. Many of them were products of the effusive evangelism of the first two decades of the century but, by and large, they and their disciples adjusted their activities to the changed circumstances of the later years of the century, conducted their religious activities calmly, and therefore accomplished much for the propagation of their faith. In Abiyokuta, 
The few Muslims among the Oulu and Digba refugees formed the foundation of an Islamic community that gradually became quite considerable and influential in the second half of the 19th century. Many refugees who were Muslims had flocked to Isain from destroyed Oyo towns and villages during their wars, attracted there by the information that there were many Muslims among the indigenes of Isain. In the second half of the century, therefore, Isain became a very strong center for Islam. There were many Muslims among the crowd of Oyo refugees who had participated in the founding of Ibadan in the 1820s. Because of the wars and the general hostility towards Iloran, these were compelled to practice their faith unobtrusively and privately. After some time, however, they formed an Islamic community, but they went too far when they proceeded to build a mosque. The government of Ibadan, under the Basarat Aluyul, ordered the mosque demolished immediately. In the changed atmosphere of the 1840s, however, the Muslim community won the patronage of some influential citizens, the most notable of whom was Opib who was Osi Balagun in the 1840s and later rose to the position of Bale of Ibadan. With the protection and assistance of such patrons, the Muslim community was at last able to build a small mosque at Oyaiba. Thereafter, the Muslim community in Ibadan experienced much success and, as a result, Islam grew rapidly in the city. In fact, many persons, free Ibadan residents and freed slaves, returning from Ibadan to their homes in various parts of Yoruba land became carriers of Islamic influence. The small town of Apay on the Ijebu coast received a sudden influx of Muslims in 1851 when political conflicts in the Lagos Kingdom forced many leading citizens of Lagos to migrate to Apay. The Cosmopolitan Society of Lagos contained many Muslims, some of them of new origin, and therefore some of the immigrants to Apay were Muslims. Ape thus suddenly became a strong Islamic town on the Ijebu coast. The general growth of Islam in the second half of the century appears to have affected all parts of Yoruba land. In Ijesa, some growth of Islam began in Ilesa in the 1860s with the return of some converted Ijesa men from Ibadan and various other parts of the country. The leader and organizer of the Muslim community here was a certain Sidu Ogun. With some patronage from Ogdemjib, they built two mosques in Ilesa before the end of the century. In Akiti, Hostility towards Islam took longer to disappear, largely because of popular memories about the Aloran invasions of Akiti in the late 1840s and the continued Aloran pretensions in Igbamana after 1887. As late as 1894, Bishop Charles Phillips noted that the Ikaitis were influenced by resentful feeling against Islam. In Ijero, Muslim converts, including an Ahero, renounced Islam. The Yui of Adu, Ali 8 who reigned from 1836 to 1885, had been converted to Islam before he came to the throne, but as king, he played his role as patron of all traditional cults, and Islam experienced no expansion in his kingdom. Nevertheless, there were small Islamic groups in a few places in Akiti. Among Oyo immigrants in Adu and Ikir, for instance, a few were Muslims and they courageously kept their faith alive. In the 1880s, some converted Adu citizens returned to Adu from Ibadan and slowly started a Muslim community going. In most of the rest of Akiti, Islam did not show much growth until the early 20th century. From the 1870s, largely because of the opening of the route to Lagos through Odondo, an Islamic group began to emerge in Odondo. The first persons in the group were from Lagos, some of them emigrants, others were from Iloran as well as persons returning home from Ibadan. During the reign of the Osemo Jimikan, 188,194, the group was finally strong enough to form a community and appoint an imam, spiritual leader. Similar circumstances as in Ondo, especially trade between the southern and northern parts of the country, particularly Aloran, accounted for the growth of Islam in places like Akuri, Owo and Ijebu in the last decades of the 19th century. Lagos became the home of one of the fastest growing Muslim communities in the second half of the century. In addition to the converts already part of Lagos society by the middle of the century, Lagos came to receive Muslims from various sources Muslims among the emigrants from the Americas and Sierra Leone and Muslims among traders and slaves from the Yoruba interior. By 1862, the number of Muslims in Lagos was estimated at 800 out of a population of about 30,000, by 1871, the number had jumped to 10,600 out of a population of 60,200 and continued to rise throughout the rest of the century. As the number of Muslims rose, mosques sprang up in various locations in Lagos. As would already be obvious from the above. Most of the spreading of Islam in Yoruba land in the late 19th century was the work of indigenous Yoruba converts. Communities of Hausa and Nuuk Muslims continued to exist, but it was the Yoruba converts who took Islam to the compounds and homes of their people. Most of the early leaders, in the 1840s and 1850s, were persons of northern Oyo origin. Later, however, 
locally born persons returning home from slavery, or from free sojourn, in Ibadan played increasingly important roles. From the 1870s when the Ondo route was opened, the influence of Aloran citizens contributed increasingly to the propagation of Islam in eastern and southern Yoruba land. Besides that, the large Yoruba Muslim population of Aloran served as encouragement and motivation to Muslim activists in all parts of Yoruba land. After all wars ended in the 1890s, Aloran became a school of Islam for Muslims ambitious for leadership roles in the Muslim communities in many parts of Yoruba land. In general also, the mode of Islamic growth in the second half of the 19th century was such as to ensure success. Paying careful respect to Yoruba indigenous culture, Yoruba converts to Islam steadily became very good at weaving their religion into the fabric of Yoruba society and culture. Some of the leaders of Islamic communities became a new elite, literate in Arabic, well informed about the outside world of Islam some of them men and women of very high levels of learning in Arabic. Everywhere, the Yoruba king, as father of all his subjects, even though not a Muslim, was successfully wooed into becoming the patron of the Muslim community in his kingdom, a patron to whom crowds of Muslim converts want to pay their respects on the Islamic festivals in imitation of the traditional practice whereby all cults took their celebrations to the king in the palace. In summary, then, by the end of the 19th century, Islam had become a powerful and well-accepted civilizing influence among Yoruba people, considerably well integrated into Yoruba society. Changes in Overseas Trade and Relations Throughout the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, the contacts of the Yoruba people with Europeans had been limited entirely to trade with European traders along the coast. Moreover, that trade had increasingly featured, throughout the three centuries, the trade in slaves. When wars broke out in the Oyo homeland and then in the rest of Yoruba land early in the 19th century, the prevailing character of the trade was greatly intensified, and Yoruba people became, for some years, the largest single nationality among slaves being exported from West Africa. However, even as the Yoruba wars were intensifying and the volume of Yoruba slave exports was skyrocketing, change was beginning. In the first decade of the century, the official attitude of Britain, the largest slave trading country, to the slave trade changed. This is no place for a full discussion of the reasons for this. Suffice it to say that very important changes in the economy of Britain, consequent mostly on the coming of the Industrial Revolution, the growth of humanitarian opposition to the traffic in human beings, and other factors, caused Britain to want to end the slave trade and substitute for a trade in the products of tropical Africa trade that came to be known as legitimate trade. In 1807, therefore, the British government passed a law that made it illegal for British citizens to participate in the slave trade, and in 1833, another law abolishing slavery in Britain and all British territorial possessions. Britain then embarked upon efforts to bring the slave trade to an end. The British Navy began to intercept slave-carrying ships on the high seas and to set free the slaves being conveyed on them. Many of such persons set free on captured ships were resettled in a settlement which the British established in Sierra Leone. As more and more European countries abolished the slave trade and slavery, the number of ships coming to the West African coast for slaves dwindled gradually, until it finally ceased during the late 1860s. For Eurobland, the immediate and far-reaching consequence of these developments was a change in the nature of trade with the outside world, a change that set Eurobland on the path to a new economy. As would be remembered from the previous chapter, as the opportunities available for exporting slaves gradually dwindled, more and more of the captives in the war stayed in the country, employed by their captors or buyers in various productive enterprises especially farming, the production of palm oil and other palm produce, and commerce. The implication of this is that, instead of draining labor from Yoruba land, the enslavement of war captives tended increasingly to result in accumulations of servile labor under certain masters for productive enterprises. The massive increase in the production of palm oil in Yoruba land in the late 19th century, the widening instances of large farming enterprises, and the great increases in the observable sizes of trading caravans all these were largely the result. In Ibadan, many chiefs and prominent citizens raised larger and larger farms, worked largely by enslaved war captives. The tradition of large farming enterprises had been established by the early leaders of the Ibadan Republic. Aluyo, the first Basaran of Ibadan, is said to have been fond of husbandry and to have had extensive plantations of okra, beans, vegetables, corn and yams, on separate farms for each. That practice increased steadily among leading Ibadan citizens throughout the century. Anna Hinderer, David Hinderer's wife, wrote that all substantial citizens of Ibadan had extensive farms which are cultivated by their slaves, whom they sometimes number by hundreds. In the late 1870s, a rich woman trader, the Ielo de Funzi Idan had more than 2,000 workers employed on her farms.
In fact, according to Anna Hinderer, every citizen of Ibadan was a farmer whatever other calling he follows, and in the seasons when farms were being cultivated or harvested, almost the entire population was engaged on the farms. In one such season in 1858, David Hinderer wanted to erect a church building, but he found that he could not procure labor for the purpose either for love or money all because everybody is wanted in the farms. The picture was the same in other parts of the country. All the notable war chiefs of the country were owners of large-scale farms. Below their level, owners of any number of slaves farmed varying acreages. During his tours beyond Ibad into places like Ife and Ilesa, Hinderer passed by many large farms owned by people who had chosen not to be involved in warfare and who had made themselves rich by farming. More and more of the labor was also devoted to an enterprise traditionally ancillary to farming, namely palm oil production. Of the crops native to Yoruba land, the one most in demand for export, and demanded in ever-increasing volumes in the growing legitimate trade, was palm oil. Cultivation of palm tree plantations was rare, but the palm tree grew naturally abundantly on farmlands in virtually all parts of Yoruba land. The Industrial Revolution in Europe demanded more and more of the palm oil for lubricants and soap manufacturers, and by the last decades of the 19th century, the ancient occupation of palm oil production had become a very large income earner for Yoruba people. Cotton also slowly increased in the exports as more and more farmers ventured into cotton farming, some of it on a large scale. And in the last years of the century, more and more farmers established kalanut plantations, to produce the type of kalanuts known as goro, kolanadita, for export to the countries north of the Niger. The 1880s also witnessed the first cocoa plantations in Yoruba land. By the 1850s Lagos had become the main port for exporting from and importing into Yoruba land. Both the imports and exports through Lagos grew more or less steadily from the 1850s until the end of the century with occasional declines due to disturbances of trade routes by the wars going on in the interior. The new economy, of which legitimate trade with the outside world was the main pillar, grew fairly steadily throughout the second half of the 19th century, generating bigger and bigger volumes of economic activity. Trade expanded, resulting in increases in the number and sizes of traders' caravans and in the volumes of merchandise, as well as in the number of persons who made large fortunes from commerce. On a journey to Ibadan in 1853, David Hinderer traveled with a caravan of traders and carriers consisting of not less than 4,000 people. The missionary, William H. Clark, has left this full description of the picture of trade in Yoruba land in the 1850s. He wrote, the trade in native produce and art keeps up continual intercommunication between the several adjacent towns, the one interchanging its abundance of one article for that of another. Thus on those smaller routes may be seen caravans of fifties passing almost daily from one town to another, acting as the great reservoirs of trade, on the long-distance routes, a network of trade is carried to a distance of hundreds of miles, and with an energy and perseverance scarcely compatible with the tropical people, hundreds and thousands of people are thus engaged in the carrying trade. Not infrequently, the articles from the Mediterranean and Western, European, coast may be seen in close proximity, and the productions of the four quarters of the globe within a circumference whose diameter may be measured by a few yards. In the disturbed state of the country, when several caravans are thrown together for the purpose of defense, a correct idea of the extent of trade may be found in the imposing numbers that stretch over several miles in length. Much of what Clark described in this passage would, of course, had been true of Yoruba land in the 18th century or perhaps even earlier with the difference that the caravans would usually have been smaller in the 18th century. The important point to note here is that, even in spite of the disturbed state of the country, Yoruba land remained a country of great trade, and Yoruba people benefited quite strongly from, and advanced, the economic transformation and progress of their country. A rich merchant class arose in Lagos, and also in Ibadan and probably most other Yoruba cities. Wealthy merchants based in Ilesa in the late 19th century became the chief sponsors of Asamalo traders doing itinerant trading all over Yoruba land, while as early as the 1880s merchants in Odondo formed a chamber of commerce. Of the richest Yoruba people of the second half of the century, the two most celebrated in popular Yoruba traditions are Madame Tanubu of Lagos and the Ilo de Funzi Itananiwira of Ibadan, both of them women. Lagos, of course came to have many people who were much richer in the last decades of the century than Madame Tanubu had been earlier in the century. One Lagos merchant of the late 19th century, Chief Taiwo Alowo, even had a shipping line of his own. It is not unlikely that Afunzi Itan was the richest person in the whole of the Yoruba interior in about the late 1870s. All these developments meant that the economy of Yoruba land was expanding quite rapidly in the 19th century. European Exploration of the Yoruba Interior the above changes were destined to affect Yoruba land in many other ways. Very importantly, 
They brought the Yoruba interior into its first direct contact with Europeans. From the beginning of the 19th century, the need especially to know the interior and the interest of the legitimate trade brought European explorers, traders and others into the Yoruba interior. The first to come was the Clapperton expedition of 18,256 through parts of western Yoruba land from Badagri to Oyoila, their purpose being to discover the course of the river Niger. From Oyoila, the expedition proceeded north to the countries of the Bariba and Noop on the Niger and then to Hausaland. Four years later, Clapperton's assistant, Richard Lander, returned with his brother John, and traversed the same part of Yoruba land travelled by the earlier expedition. Thereafter, especially from the 1850s, various Europeans and Americans penetrated more widely into Yoruba land, going as far east as Igbamana and Dekiti. Some note has earlier been made of these men especially the English commercial traveller Daniel May, the American Baptist missionary T.J. Bowen, and William H. Clark. We owe to these travellers our earliest written direct information about the Yoruba interior. No matter what their motives for coming into the interior, the explorers, as representatives of European culture, came face to face for the first time in history with the deep seats of Yoruba culture and with the centers of Yoruba power and government first with rulers subordinate to the Ilafin, then with the Ilafin himself, ruler of the then greatest state in the West African forests, and then with the other kingdoms and states of the Yoruba people. As strangers in the land, the explorers lived under the authority of the host governments, obeyed the laws of the land, and respected the culture of their hosts. Their coming was historically significant. It began to introduce in depth two peoples who had known each other only peripherally for centuries. For both, it represented a step in the worldwide evolution of what has come to be generally known as the modern world. The Return of the Emigrants Another important promoter of change in 19th century Yoruba land was the return from the Americas and other places, in gradually increasing numbers, of persons of Yoruba origin who had won their freedom from slavery abroad. From early in the century, some of these persons, especially from Cuba and Brazil, took the step of returning home to their own country. As the Atlantic slave trade slowly wound down during the century, the number of the returnees, better known as emigrants, increased. Furthermore, recaptives who were resettled in Sierra Leone had among the many Yoruba, representing most subgroups, Oyo, Igba, Ijebu, Ife, Ijesa, Ahidi, etc., and these also desired to return home to Yoruba land. In the Americas or in Sierra Leone, these returning ex-slaves had obtained some Western education and varying levels of various types of new skills as carpenters, masons, farmers, traders, etc. Many had been converted to Christianity, but there were also many who were Muslims either Muslims before they were enslaved, or converted to Islam by fellow slaves abroad. From early in the century until the end of it, the emigrants kept arriving from Sierra Leone, Brazil, and Cuba. Their total number is not known but it most probably belonged in the range of tens of thousands. In 1851, a British naval officer, on a visit to Abeokuta, estimated that there were as many as 3,000 emigrants in Abeokuta, and another naval officer that there were hundreds in Badagri. By the same date, there were very many others in Lagos, Ibadan, Ij, and in many towns and villages further up country in Iwo, Eid, Osogbo, Ilesa, Ajigbo, Iragbiji, even Iloran. By the 1880s and 1890s, Many had settled as far inland as some towns in Ekiti. With the opening of the route through Odondo in the 1870s, some came and settled in the Ilahe, Ikali and Ondo towns and villages. After Lagos became a British colony in 1861, more of the arriving emigrants chose to live in Lagos. By the last quarter of the century, Lagos had the largest population of emigrants in Yoruba land. The return of these people was to contribute enormously to making the 19th century an era of great and important changes in Yoruba history. They were the first Yoruba people to have some Western education, and the first to be Christians. Working under the auspices of the Christian organizations, they served as pioneers of the Christian religion in almost all parts of Yoruba land. Throughout the history of Christianity in Yoruba land in the 19th century, the majority of Christian missionaries were Yoruba people. One of the Christianized emigrants, the man who later became famous as Bishop Samuel Ajayi Crowther, deserves a brief special note. Ajayi was 15 years old when he was seized from his small hometown of Asagun near Isain in the dry season of late 1821. As a captive, he was sold to a woman trader in the Igba town of Ij, and from there he was sold from trader to trader until he reached Lagos where he was sold to a Portuguese slaving ship, the Esperanza Felix, on April 7, 1822. That same evening, while still in the vicinity of Lagos, the Esperanza Felix was captured by British naval ships. The slaves on the Esperanza Felix were liberated and taken to Sierra Leone, 
Ajayi arrived in Sierra Leone in June 1822 as a freed youth one of the earliest Yoruba recaptives to arrive in the settlement. In Sierra Leone he was baptized as Samuel Ajayi Crowther. Intelligent, industrious and humble, he won the affection of the Christian missionaries who then taught him to read and write and took him to England in 1826, where he attended school for a few months. By the time he returned to Sierra Leone in 1827, the school that was later to become Fora Bay College was being established, and he was enrolled as its first student. Trained there as a teacher, he went on to teach in various schools. In 1841, when the missionaries in Sierra Leone decided to send an expedition to Badagri on the Yoruba coast, Samuel Crowther at last returned to the land of his fathers as a missionary of the Church Missionary Society, CMS, of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. From then on, he served at various mission stations in Yoruba land and rose steadily in the service of the CMS. By the 1860s, the missionary enterprise had extended to the Niger country comprising the Noop territory and the area south of it to the Niger Delta. In 1864, Samuel Ajayi Crowther was consecrated bishop of the growing Niger mission thus becoming the first black African to rise to that position in Africa. While the Christians among the emigrants thus expanded the influence of Christianity in Yoruba land, the Muslims among them also assisted the growth of Islam in various parts of the country. In Lagos in particular, they became leaders of Muslim communities, and contributed immensely to the growth of Islam as a major religious influence. Of very great importance in Yoruba history also was the contribution of the emigrants to the expansion of Western education. They were the first school teachers in most communities in Yoruba and the native advance guard of a revolutionary movement that would ultimately, in the next century, make the Yoruba people one of the most literate in Africa. Equally important, the emigrants themselves invested heavily in Western education for their children. In many new schools, the first students were emigrants' children. Many of the sons and daughters of the Lagos emigrants especially were sent to various universities and other educational institutions in England, and began to return in the last years of the 19th century and the first years of the 20th as the first generation of lawyers, doctors, journalists, accountants, men of letters, in the territory that was by then being constituted to become the British colony and protectorate of Nigeria. They and other Yoruba men and women educated like them provided the new country of Nigeria with its first crop of indigenous civil servants and professionals. A very important aspect of the development of literacy in Yoruba land was the rendering of the Yoruba language and writing, and in this also the Yoruba emigrants played a significant role. Increased European contacts with the interior of Yoruba land from the 1820s generated a desire to write the language down. In the appendix to his journal of his 18,256 travels in Yoruba land, Clap Purden made a list of a few Yoruba words. But it was the Christian missions, and missionaries of various denominations and various European nationalities, that pushed forward the effort to create a generally acceptable orthography for the writing of the Yoruba language in their desire to make the Bible, Christian worship manuals, hymnals, and other Christian literature available to Yoruba people. Samuel Ajayi Crowther took a leading part in all this from the beginning. The CMS began in 1843 to conduct services in Yoruba in the Sierra Leone settlement. Crowther did the first Yoruba translation of some texts from the New Testament, conducted the first Yoruba language services, and preached the first sermons in Yoruba. Other mission groups followed suit. However, the creation of a generally accepted Yoruba orthography did not come easily. This grew gradually over the next three decades as a result of the work of language experts and Christian mission leaders of various European nationalities. The emigrant Yoruba employees of the various mission bodies were widely involved in the search for answers in the making of the orthography, and led the way in increasingly employing Yoruba translations and writings in their daily Christian work in their mission stations. Throughout, Crowther stayed in the forefront of the emigrant contributions to this historic development and, among other things, ultimately wrote a dictionary of the Yoruba language. By 1875, it was possible at last to hold a general conference of all concerned, mission leaders and language experts called to the task by the mission bodies, in order to finalize the decades-long discussions and arguments on the details of a common orthography. The conference was held in the CMS Mission House, St. Peter's, Faji, Lagos, on January 28 and 29, 1875. Reverend, by then Bishop, Samuel Ajayi Crowther was chairman, assisted by Reverend Adolphus Mann, a German, as vice chairman, and Reverend J.B. Wood, an Englishman, as secretary. The orthography as agreed upon in this conference has remained substantially the accepted Yoruba orthography till the end of the 20th century a fact which, according to Adi Ajayi, constitutes the greatest tribute to the excellence and the thoroughness of the work of the pioneers from many lands.
This was one of the greatest gifts of the 19th century to Yoruba civilization. With that task so excellently accomplished, the foundation was laid, according to the Reverend Henry Johnson, brother of Samuel Johnson, author of the history of the Yorubas, for progress to any extent for the Yoruba nation. Of the emigrants settled in Lagos, very many ventured into trade, as agents of the growing legitimate trade, mostly as factors or subsidiaries of the European merchant companies. Because they were Yoruba, easily reintegrating into the native culture and speaking the language, and even discovering and re-establishing lost family ties, they became the ideal organizers of trading caravans that took imported goods for distribution in the interior and brought export goods back. Some grew to become significant merchants and built up considerable fortunes from trade. The desire of the original sponsors of the emigrants from Sierra Leone was that they would, on return to their country, go into farming and spread the Christian message. Some did go into farming, but their success in that venture was very limited. The most significant contribution of emigrants to the development of agriculture in Europe land was their introduction of some new crops. Of the crops from the Americas, the most important was cocoa, which was to become, in the 20th century, the greatest cash crop of Yoruba farmers and for decades the foremost foreign exchange earner for Nigeria. Another crop was cassava. Cassava was known in some places in West Africa, for instance in Dahomey, before the 19th century, but it was in the late 19th century that it spread into Yoruba land. The emigrants, especially those from Brazil, are believed to have been responsible for the propagation of cassava as a common crop of Yoruba farmers. Yet another crop was rice. Rice was grown before the 19th century in the region of West Africa to which Sierra Leone belongs, as well as in Alida, and it was from Sierra Leone that the emigrants brought it to Yoruba land. In the course of the 20th century, all these crops were to become very important in the economic life of Yoruba people. As the emigrants settled in Lagos, their attention was gripped by the wars going on in Yoruba land. In general, they passionately desired that the war should end so that the homeland could return to peace and order. After the British seized the Kingdom of Lagos as a British colony in 1861, the emigrants, as well as Christian missions and foreign traders in Lagos, began to pressurize the British government of the colony to intervene for peace in the Yoruba interior. When the Kirji War started in 18,778, it generated some division in the ranks of the emigrants in Lagos. Those of them who were of Ijesa and Ekiti origin believed that the revolt of the Ekiti and Ijesa against Ibadan was justified and that the Ekiti Parapo was the underdog in the Kerji War. Therefore, as would be remembered, they organized to give assistance to the Ekiti Parapo. In spite of that, however, the emigrant community as a whole never relented in its pressure on the Lagos government for intervention in the wars until it finally intervened in 1886. From then on, the Lagos government remained involved in the tortuous quest for peace until all the major wars were brought to an end in 1893. In summary then, when the persons later known as emigrants first left their homeland, they left it as slaves and therefore as losses to their families, communities, and country. Most of those who left in this way never returned but became assets to the lands where they had been taken in the Americas. However, the few who returned became blessings in many ways, and served as agents of progress to their native land. In them and through them, the Yoruba country and people received significant compensation for the heavy losses occasioned by the century-long wars in Yoruba land. The Coming of Christianity The first batch of Christian missionaries landed at Badagri in 1842, preceded there by some emigrants from Sierra Leone. The intention of the missionaries was to establish in Badagri their base for sending missions to the interior, but they quickly found the town unsuitable. Badagri's formerly thriving trade in slaves had fallen because the British naval patrols had frightened the slaving ships away, and legitimate trade had not yet picked up. The town was dull and depressed, and the people were in no mood to cooperate with the missionaries. Consequently, they decided to move further inland to Abeokuta, a new and vibrant city. At first, the Abeokuta chiefs, led by Sodik, hesitated to welcome the missionaries, but later reconsidered the matter, hoping that they would be helpful to the city in its political maneuvers with Ibadan, Ijebu, Lagos and other enemies. Abiyokuta thus became the first Christian missionary base in Yoruba land, and quickly became known in Christian circles in Britain as the sunrise within the tropics. Soon after, mission stations were established in Badagri and Lagos. Emigrants served in leading positions in all these missions from the beginning. Samuel Ajayi Crowther was a leading missionary in the Anglican mission in Abiyokuta. From 1849 to 1859, the Methodist mission in Abiyokuta was led by an emigrant of Igba origin, Edward Bickersteth. From the 1850s, Christian missions expanded rapidly into other parts of Yoruba land. In 1853, a mission was established in Ibadan, 
which later became a center from which missionary agents were sent to many places in the further interior. Another center was established in Ij in the same year. From Lagos, mission stations were set up at Igbesa, Ikorodu, and Sagamu, but Ijebuod refused permission for a mission station at the time. Between 1853 and 1858, leaders of the Ibeokuda missions toured the country intensively north to Oyo, Awaye, Isain, Saki, and Ogbomoso, and west to Ibera, Asaga, Iloro, and Ketu, at most of which places mission stations, manned by emigrants, were soon set up. In Iloran, the Amir received the missionaries well but withheld permission for a mission station. The leader of the Anglican mission in Ibadan, David Hinderer, toured the country east of Ibadan, and agents were placed as a result in Ilesa, Ife, and Modak. Political developments in the Ife Modak area stunted the development of the Ife and Modak stations, and both soon died out. After the opening of the route through Ondo in 1872, a strong Anglican mission station was established at Odondo, and smaller ones at Idabu in the Ilahe Creeks and Aizen in the Ondo Southern Forests. The Odondo mission then became the center for missionary expansion northeastwards and eastwards into Ife, Ijesa, and Akiti. Before the end of the century, mission stations had sprung up in Modak, Ife, Adu, Ijero, Ayade, Ais, Akuri, Ikir, and missionary activity was to expand from these places to other Akiti towns and to Akoko and Owo. By 1900 indeed, virtually all towns and villages of the Yoruba people housed Christian missions, sponsored by various Christian denominations Anglicans, Methodists, Baptists, and Roman Catholics. In a little over 50 years, then, Christian missions started and spread over all parts of Yoruba land. That rapid development benefited much from the civilization of the country its cities and towns, its age-old road networks, its tradition of acceptance and protection of strangers, its general toleration of religious differences, its respect, even in wartime, for the traitor and the peaceful traveler. Everywhere, missionaries in charge of outflung mission stations knew that they lived in a society of law, among law-respecting neighbors, and under the protection of kings and subordinate kings who, by the ancient lore of the land, were protectors and patrons of the stranger. It also helped greatly that most of the mission agents were emigrants from the Americas and Sierra Leone that is Yoruba indigenes who had gone far away and learned new things and were returning home to teach those new things to their people. In many places, the new religion and the native religion of the Yoruba people brushed against each other. When David Hinderer preached the Christian message for the first time to an audience in the Unis Palace in Ife, the chiefs welcomed him warmly but assured him that Ife was the springhead of all religion and that what he had preached to them was, in effect, nothing new. In the early days of the mission in the Bay Okuda, some native converts were arrested by the chiefs for some unacceptable behavior. When the leaders of the mission, including Crowther, went to intercede with the chiefs on behalf of the people under arrest, the head chief of Idiku, reported Crowther, said he had no quarrel with us, neither with the Sierra Leonean emigrants in his town, they might come to church and do as they pleased, but he checked his people from doing so because they must do as their forefathers used to do, and they have no business with us, missionaries, he said moreover, that we never gave them any person to make Ogboni, nor to worship Ifa, nor Sango, etc. Moreover, that one of us called the worship of their deceased forefathers a lie. In a do in around 1899, because some Christian converts made a habit of ridiculing the Agungun cult, whip carrying Agungun mask bearers targeted Christian Sunday services for some weeks, until the UE had to intervene to bring the attacks to an end and make peace between the Christian converts and the leaders of the Agungun cult. Local incidents such as the above were probably common. As would be obvious from most of the instances here, the problem was usually not with the religion of Christianity as such, but with unacceptable or provocative behavior by Christian converts. It was in a Biokuta, sunrise within the tropics, ironically, that the Christian missions encountered the greatest conflict. The root of the problem was not religious, it sprang from the fact that the white missionaries were perceived as agents of the British government. Until about 1860 that perception suited both the Biokuta and the Christian mission work beautifully. When, for instance, Dahomey brought a large army to attack a Bayokuta in 1851, the missionaries did not only join in the defense of the city, they also influenced British authorities along the coast to send help. The Dahomey army, commanded by their king, Gezo, marched all the way to the walls of a Bayokuta, but they were defeated there and pushed back. So far, then, Sodik's original hope that the missionaries might become helpful to Abeokuta was wonderfully realized and the missionaries therefore became the more acceptable to the Abeokuta authorities. Thereafter, however, developments gradually changed the tone of Abeokuta's relationship with the Christian missions.
the year 1861 was the turning point. From the time Lagos was annexed, the British colonial administration began to take steps aimed at keeping the roads to the interior open and free, in their attempts to promote trade. The hostilities between Ibadan and Abeo Kuta frequently threatened the roads. Since Ibadan and the British were agreed in the desire to have the roads open and free, Abeo Kuta authorities came to perceive British policies as favoring Ibadan at their expense. Inevitably, the missionaries, who were seen as agents of the British, lost favor with the Abeo Kuta authorities. The culmination of all this came in 1867 when the Lagos colonial government's virtual annexation of Abute Meta, over which Abeo Kuta claimed ownership, left Abeo Kuta feeling very threatened. Led by Akaju, the Siriki of the Igba, and Salonk, the Jagna of Vigbine, crowds of enraged warboys and members of the public went on a rampage and destroyed the houses of the missionaries and most of the valuables of the churches. All the European missionaries, as well as some emigrants and converts, fled to Lagos. This incident became known as the Eiffel that is, housebreaking. However, when the dust from the Eiffel settled, it became clear that Abeo Kuta people were not after the converts or emigrants, they were after the white missionaries that is, British people. The Eiffel thus left the affairs of the missions in the interior entirely in the hands of the emigrant missionaries and prominent converts. The white missionaries would not be able to return until the 1880s. A very important consequence of this development was that the Christian venture by all missions in the Yoruba hinterland became effectively indigenous in its personnel and management. Christian missionary efforts had also penetrated to the Niger, also largely through the agency of Yoruba emigrants. In June 1864, Samuel Crowther was consecrated in England as Bishop of the CMS Niger Mission. Crowther's Niger Mission extended from the Noop country on the Middle Niger, through Lokoja and Onitsha, south to the small states of the Niger Delta. In addition, although he was not explicitly named over the CMS Yoruba mission, he had considerable authority over the Yoruba mission also. Traveling from end to end in this vast territory to supervise and establish mission stations, Crowther became the most important officer of Christianity in West Africa. His usual annual agenda saw him in Lagos in the dry season, from November or December to February or March, visiting nearby mission stations and writing his dispatches and reports, from Lagos he would go by ship to the Delta, Bonnie. Kalabari, Brass, etc., then in June he would proceed northwards to Onitsha, Lokoja, Ega, Bida, in October he would return to the Delta and, from there, to Lagos in November or December. What all this meant was that the Christian enterprise in the interior of the country that was later to be known as Nigeria was given a taste of indigenous independence and control quite early in its history, with Yoruba clergy as the leaders. Rivalry between Islam and Christianity as would be expected, the paths of Christianity and Islam began to cross in Yoruba land from about the middle of the century. Conversions to Christianity picked up only slowly, whereas conversions to Islam grew quite fast in many parts of Yoruba land in the late 19th century. Consequently, the leaders of the Christian missions began to be concerned about the success of Islam. The Christian group that responded the most vigorously to the Islamic challenge was the Anglican, whose church missionary society was the largest and most active of all the mission agencies. In 1875, one of their leaders, Rev. James Johnson, put forth a plan for confronting Islam. His plan laid down many directives for Christian workers, first, that local church ministers should serve more as missionaries, and spend more time in evangelizing, than as administrative pastors, secondly, that local ministers should learn Arabic so as to be better able to combat Islamic scholars and preachers, thirdly, that Christian tracts should be produced in Yoruba and Arabic for the benefit of Muslims, and finally, that Muslim children coming to Christian schools should be given as much Christianity as possible. This plan became the basic guideline of Christianity's response to the challenge of Islam in Yoruba land. A large crop of Anglican ministers emerged, dedicated to the struggle against Islam among the older ministers Samuel Crowther and James Johnson, and among the younger, enterprising and tireless fighters like R.S. Oyabode, G.B. Foster and A.W. Smith. In written tracts and debates, these men combated Muslims everywhere. By the 1890s a very elevated and energetic rivalry was alive between Christians and Muslims in Yoruba land, as the activism of the Christian ministers energized some of the most informed Muslims. And the tradition of the rivalry continued into the 20th century. On the whole, in terms of conversion of the general population of unbelievers, the rivalry benefited both Christianity and Islam very bountifully, even though the hold of the traditional religion on Yoruba political and social customs remained quite strong. The Coming of Western Education from the very beginning of Christian missionary work in Yoruba land in the 1840s, every mission station, as soon as it opened, started a school and went out to urge parents to enroll their children, 
Samuel Crowther was a strong advocate of mission schools, believing that it was an inexpensive and effective way of penetrating the indigenous population. In probably every mission station, the missionaries encountered an initial resistance to their efforts to attract the children to school. For instance, the leader of the Odondo mission, Charles Phillips, found that when he visited parents and urged them to send their children to school, they would readily promise to do so, but that such promises were usually not fulfilled. As a result, he had to visit the same parents over and over again. This was an initial period in the life of every mission school, a period when parents did not know what schools were about and hesitated to hand their children over to strangers. In most new mission schools, therefore, the first students were children of the missionaries themselves plus children and dependents of prominent citizens like chiefs. Even after children had enrolled, mission schools tended generally to face the problems posed by irregular attendance, as well as premature withdrawal of children from schools for work on the farms. Missionaries discovered that the best solution to these problems was to persuade parents to allow their children to be brought up by missionaries in the mission house. In this way the institution of boarding school became a regular feature of the mission house and school. In spite of these and other problems, however, schools spread out in Yoruba land and the number of children enrolled in, and graduating from, mission schools rose gradually. The areas with the earliest missions, like Abeokuta and Ibadan, became the providers of school teachers for the newer mission centers in eastern Yoruba land. As the 19th century rolled towards an end, the impact of the mission schools was beginning to be felt substantially among Yoruba people. A new class was emerging, marked by its literacy, its ability to speak the English language, or the French language in the far western region of Yoruba land, its knowledge of the outside world, and its possession of new skills and professions as clerks, Christian church workers, interpreters, teachers, lawyers, doctors, journalists, accountants, etc., pillars of a new Yoruba society that was beginning to evolve. Of course, Lagos, where the emigrants were most concentrated, led the way in the growth of Western education. Finding that Western education created access to opportunities in the service of the colonial government and the European merchant companies, Lagos people soon went far ahead of the rest of Europe land in educating their offspring. As would be remembered, long before the end of the century, Lagos youths educated in colleges and universities in England were already providing Europe land with its first crop of doctors, lawyers men of letters and other highly educated professionals. Beginnings of Modern Yoruba Nationalism A very important outcome of the growing literacy in Yoruba land during the 19th century was the marked emphasis it brought upon Yoruba national consciousness and unity. As is obvious from previous chapters, the Yoruba had been, from ancient times, intensely conscious of their identity and cultural unity as one people. The strong commonalities in Yoruba culture, the powerful myths of common origin, the widespread and very influential myths and traditions around Ife and the name of Odudua, the common pantheon of gods and spirits, the common political culture and practices and the universal belief in the common ancestry of Yoruba ruling dynasties all these were components of a strong consciousness of national identity and unity. The Yoruba lived in their many kingdoms and ethnic subgroups, but consciousness of the larger ethnic group ran through their lives, their politics, their rituals and worship, their economic institutions and practices, and their total worldview. Even in the considerable disruption by wars in the 19th century, the consciousness of oneness as a people remained strong. The rulers of the strong city of Ibadan urged the Uni elect of Ife to remember that he was father of all our tribes and the giver of the war banners of all the kingdoms of all our people. Whether or not a common group name was part of this whole picture of group consciousness from early times, we do not know. By the beginning of the 19th century, no such common group name seemed to be acknowledged by all Yoruba people. An ancient name, the name Yoruba, circulated among them and had for centuries been used by their neighbors in the western Sudan to identify them, but the first persons to be addressed as Yoruba among Yoruba recaptives in Sierra Leone in the early 19th century rejected the name and insisted on being identified by their subgroup names, Ijebu, Ijesa, etc. Yet, within only a few years, the Yoruba community in Sierra Leone had generally adopted the name Yoruba. And as the influence of the literate immigrants and other Western-educated Yoruba grew in the course of the 19th century, and as Western education expanded in Yoruba land, the fundamental common ethnic consciousness in Yoruba people became powerfully stimulated and, during the second half of the century, the name Yoruba became rapidly universally embraced as the common name for the whole Yoruba nation. The consequent upsurge of Yoruba cultural nationalism was to stimulate national unity and solidarity. Rapidly in the years after 1893, 
the divisive passions of the Arab wars were superseded by Yoruba national consciousness a major factor in the making of Yoruba political strength and influence, and in Yoruba economic and social successes, in the 20th century, especially in the context of Nigeria. The belief in common descent from Odudua, a belief that had for many centuries been a strong factor of Yoruba consciousness and life, served as the readily available rallying symbol for this national movement. In the course of the 20th century, the name of Oduduwa was to become perhaps the most visible rallying banner of any one African nationality. One very important aspect, and booster, of this growth of Yoruba cultural nationalism was the beginning of writings by literate Yoruba about the Yoruba people, their history, and their institutions. The men of Yoruba origin employed in the Christian missions, and the growing number of literate people in various parts of the country, were attracted to the fascinating traditions of the past preserved in every Yoruba community, and began to write about them as well as about current happenings in Yoruba land. John Augustus Otunba Payne of Lagos became the leading person among the early writers, with his Lagos and West African Almanac published annually from 1874. As will be seen later, in the chapter on the 20th century, writing on Yoruba history and institutions was to grow very richly during the last decade of the 19th century and to become even richer in the 20th century. The reduction of the language into writing during the 19th century, and the emergence of a common Yoruba orthography enabled some of the writers to produce their works in the Yoruba language and this was to become a very significant cultural development during the 20th century. Imposition of European Rule The closing act of the 19th century, the century of great changes and transformations, was the imposition of British rule on most of Yoruba land and of French and German rule on the rest. As the 20th century opened, all Yoruba people, like all other peoples of tropical Africa, were subjects of European imperialist overlords. The coastal kingdom of Lagos was the first part of Yoruba land to become a British possession. The British first interfered in the politics of the Lagos government in 1851. A contest for the throne of Lagos resulted in that year in one prince, Kosako, seizing the throne from his rival, Akitoe. Claiming that their motive was to put an end to the slave trade in Lagos, the British intervened, bombarded the island, forced out Kosako, who was said to be a slave trader, and helped Akitoe who was said to be opposed to the slave trade, to regain the throne. The immediate consequence of the British action was to install the British, rather than Akatoe, as the controllers of Lagos. Before then, the British had been more or less shut out of the trade of Lagos by the Portuguese and Brazilians. From 1851, the British became dominant in the trade of Lagos and of Yoruba land. Lagos thus gave the British a strong foothold on the Yoruba coast. The wars going on in the interior, and the British interest to promote the trade of Lagos, combined to increase British interest in the Yoruba hinterland. In 1861, the British bombarded the port town of Ajis, Porto Novo. Moreover, seeing the British as the formidable power on the Yoruba coast, some towns of the Igbado country, Ipokia, Okoden and Adu, under constant military pressure from Dahomey and Abeokuta, applied to the British government of Lagos for protection. Meanwhile, however, the French were active in the Asia country and intended to expand from their eastwards into western Yoruba and especially to create a French quarter through Igbato and Igba territory to the Middle Niger. Consequently, a rivalry developed between the British and the French over western Yoruba land. In order to prevent British expansion towards the west and to create a coastal base for their own expansion eastwards, the French declared a protectorate over Porto Novo in 1862. During the 1880s, the Anglo-French rivalry became more and more intense. At last, however, in 1889 the two reached an agreement establishing a boundary that placed the Igbato kingdoms of Iloro, Ipokia, Adu, Okoten, Ajili, Igbesa, the Awari kingdom of Badagri, and parts of the kingdoms of Ketu, Sabe, and Ifanyan, under the British. In 1891, the British proclaimed a protectorate over those territories. The 1889 Anglo-French agreement thus settled the rivalry and ended French interest east of Porto Novo. In the end, all that the French acquired in Yoruba land comprised Itaki, Ohori Ije, Ipobo, and parts of the kingdoms of Ketu, Ifanyan, and Sabe. Of these kingdoms, the French acquired the royal towns in the metropolitan provinces, while many of their subordinate towns and villages fell into the British area of influence. In 1892, the French invaded and conquered the kingdom of Dahomey. The Dahomey kingdom, by then comprising all the Asia territories, together with the French Yoruba acquisitions, became the French protectorate of Dahomey. To the west, French Dahomey shared a boundary with Germany's territory of Togo, and that boundary placed a small part of Yorubland, especially the western Ife, 
under German rule in Togo until 1918 when Togo also came under the French as a mandated territory. European imperialism thus divided Yoruba land between three different countries the greater part in British Nigeria, a much smaller part in French Dahomey, and a still smaller part in German, later French, Togo. For the Yoruba people of the subgroups and kingdoms of Western Yoruba land, there thus arose two international boundaries splitting kingdoms, communities and families, and demanding to be observed and respected as against the people's family, kinship, ethnic, cultural, political and historical bonds of unity. In 1892 also, the British invaded the Ijebu country. The Ijebu owed government under Iboki, Fidepot's successor, while allowing the people of Ibadan to come and trade in the northern Ijebu towns, had resolutely continued to refuse free traffic between Lagos and Ibadan through Ijebu territory. Since British diplomacy failed to change the situation, the British resorted to force. On the pretext that the Ijebu owed authorities had insulted the British Queen during a Lagos official's visit, the British commenced a military expedition into Ijebu, whose people prepared to defend their country. The final encounter took place at Magbon. The Ijebu forces fought gallantly, but in the end they had no answer for the British artillery pieces. The British therefore occupied and annexed the Ijebu Ode Kingdom and the rest of the Ijebu country. In the further Yoruba interior, the success of the British government of Lagos in persuading Ibadan and Ikiti Parapo to sign a peace treaty in 1886 had immensely boosted their image. As the years dragged on after 1886 and the Yoruba themselves showed no ability to move the peace process forward, all eyes turned to the British for help. In addition to the missionaries, the Lagos traders, the Lagos emigrant community, and significant Yoruba kings, especially the Alafin, appealed to the Lagos administration to intervene and bring the wars to an end. Therefore, in 1888, the British signed a treaty with the Alafin, and in 1893, treaties with the Alafin and Ibadan separately. By 1893, Therefore, the ground was prepared for a final resolution of the deadlock on the Kerji war front as well as of other difficulties. Therefore, a high-powered commission of the Lagos government accompanied by a small unit of troops proceeded into the interior and saw to the departure of the Ibadan and Dikiti Parapo armies from the Kerji front. With that, the greatest war in the Yoruba interior finally came to an end. At a ceremony on the River Odin, the Ibadan Aloran hostilities were also brought to an end. British intervention had the historic consequence of giving to the British a wonderful opportunity to pursue their own imperial interests in the interior of Yoruba land. In the treaty signed with Yoruba rulers after 1886, the British included harmless-looking clauses which provided for, or implied, British protection and sovereignty. The most important of such treaties was the one with Ibadan. Its clause 4 provided for the stationing in Ibadan of a British resident, whose duty it would be to ensure that wars would not be resumed. With the first resident, Captain R. L. Bauer, in Ibadan, it very quickly became clear that the British, as represented by the British administration of Lagos, had taken over the whole of the Yoruba interior with the exception of Aloran and an indefinite boundary area in the southeast, comprising the Owo Kingdom. From then on, the assertion of British sovereignty, and the details of the administration of a British protectorate, with its headquarters in Ibadan, proceeded apace. In 1897, Two other agencies of British imperialism took possession of the rest of Yoruba and north and east of Ibadan. Forces of the Royal Niger Company, conquering the lands of the Niger Valley and the territories north of the Niger, established control over the distant northeastern Yoruba territories, the homelands of the Yagba, Jammu, Banu, O, and Oworo, and parts of Agbamana, and conquered Aloran. In the same year, forces of the Niger Coast Protectorate invaded and conquered the Kingdom of Benin and proceeded to treat the Owo Kingdom as part of the area under its control. In the years that followed, Owo found its proper place in Yoruba land in the administrative unit that became known as the Protectorate of Southern Nigeria. Eloran and the other Yoruba territories initially controlled or claimed by the Royal Niger Company, as well as most of Egbomina and parts of Northern Akiti, were, however, included in the Protectorate of Northern Nigeria. Other than the conquest of these northern Yoruba territories by the agency of the Royal Niger Company, which had also conquered much of northern Nigeria, there was no real justification for including them in northern Nigeria, separate from their people in southern Nigeria. Thus European imperial overlordship commenced, for the Yoruba people, with the fragmentation of Yoruba land, first between three different countries, Nigeria, Dahomey and Togo, and then, in Nigeria, into two parts, with two different British imperial administrations. In 1914, the Protectorate of Northern Nigeria and the Colony and Protectorate of Southern Nigeria were amalgamated as one country, the Colony and Protectorate of Nigeria, while remaining two separate administrations of that country, 
In spite of the obvious historical and ethnic irrationality of their territorial arrangement that had split Yoruba land into two in Nigeria, the British preserved that split throughout their overlordship over Nigeria. A 19th century overview. We must conclude this and the previous chapter together then with the statement that the 19th century was, for Yoruba people, a great century of change, transformation and progress. Because the Yoruba wars of the century were extensive, tumultuous and had a great impact, one can be tempted to view the 19th century in Yoruba history as a century of wars. But such a characterization would be wrong. It was a century of a whole complex of huge and many-sided movements of change. Yoruba land and Yoruba society were very different by 1900 from what they had been in 1800. Cities, states and centers of population and power non-existent in 1800 dominated the geography and politics of Yoruba land by the 1890s, replacing many of the great centers of power dominant in 1800. The impact of Islam, Christianity and Western education, as well as significant economic changes had, by 1900, transformed Yoruba society far beyond what it had been in 1800. Of course, there were innumerable and fundamental continuities. For instance, the Yoruba language was, by 1900, still itself, with its many dialects, but a standard Yoruba was evolving the standard for all written communication in Yoruba, and the language taught in the schools. Born out of efforts to translate the Bible and other Christian literature, the standard Yoruba language, a creative amalgam of various Yoruba dialects, was already formalized with an alphabet and poised to become the preeminent common dialect. The Babalawo, the Anaskan, and the priests of the ancient Yoruba gods were still the notables of spiritual leadership, but they were beginning to have in their lineages the Islamic priest and the Christian priest, both of whom were making a strong bid to redirect the spiritual consciousness of all Yoruba people. Increasingly, the calendar of religious festivities in every community came to include days of Islamic, Christian, and traditional rituals and festivals. As new tools were coming into the service of old professions and pastimes, new ones were making their appearance. The Oba was still the lieutenant of the gods, but new elites, products of the wars, of Islam, of Christianity, of Western education, of commerce and other economic enterprise, had, by the 1890s, appeared confidently on the scene. By 1895, the Yoruba people were very much a people advancing upon new frontiers. One other important point needs to be made. The Ibadan-based attempt to unify, with the force of arms, all of Yoruba land into one single state though fairly successful until about 1877, never had much of a chance in some parts of the country, and ultimately ran into widespread resistance. But besides that, other strong unifying developments entered upon the scene the emergence and growth of a literate elite that became gradually, and then aggressively, pan-Yoruba in consciousness, the upsurge of Yoruba cultural nationalism, with its many ramifications, the making of a common orthography for writing the Yoruba language, the gradual evolution of a modern economy, the emergence of a business and professional class, etc. All of these combine to point to great possibilities for the future of the Yoruba as one people. In fact, the chances looked good that, if the advancing trends had been allowed to continue in their native strength, the outcome could have been the emergence of a modern Yoruba nation state in West Africa similar to how the Japanese unified their country about the same time and rapidly became a powerful modern nation state in Asia. The imposition of European rule over Yoruba land cut off the possibility of a progression to such an outcome for the Yoruba people. 